Um, I want to talk to you guys about a very difficult subject, but it is ultimately at the very heart of this church. Um, in, in, in March of this year, New York Times published an article um, describing the current state of race in America in the church. And, and uh, the article was titled, A Quiet Exodus, Why Black Worshippers Are Leaving White Evangelical Churches. And the article details what many are noticing as a sporadic but slow and trickle-like exodus of black folk from predominantly white churches in America. After, which of, after what appeared to be a very promising time for integration, diverse integration in church life. Now we're starting to see the exact opposite, a shift of sorts, where, whereas they were once, once churches, there seemed to be a uh, coming together, now there seems to be a parting of ways. And one woman that was interviewed in the article gave this very insightful remark that probably reflects a lot of exasperated African-American voices in multicultural churches. She said, she said this, Tamise Spencer was her name. She used to attend a mostly white church in Kansas City, and she said that her fellow congregants did not seem to even know the name of Trayvon Martin, the black teenager killed in Florida, or they seemed to not really know any of the other individuals that were wounded and killed by gunfire. And when, and when Ms. Spencer brought up his death and the death of others, she said that her white church members asked why she was being divisive. And she said this, she says, it's not even on your radar, and yet I can't sleep over it, she remembered thinking. And now that I'm being vocal, you think I've changed. There was another quote that stood out to me in this article, and it, and, and it came from Michael Emerson, who wrote the book Divided by Faith, a seminal work on race relations within the evangelical church. And this is what he said. He said, everything we tried is not working, talking about churches coming together, black, white, under one banner in America. The election itself was the single most harmful event to the whole movement of reconciliation in at least the past 30 years, he said. It's about to completely break apart. In other words, he said he was talking about the 2016 election and how after the election, they saw more people move away from each other in churches than they had seen in several decades of the race reconciliation movement. Everything we tried is not working, those words linger with me because unity is elusive we can see that throughout history unity is elusive so many voices on the far edges and fringes of our lives are dictating the conversation to us so many people committed to not giving up one square inch on their opinions their philosophies and their partisanship so many voices and so few ears Yet it is in the midst of this kind of chaotic and volatile season of this American history that God has put together this church. This church was birthed in 2016. This is when this church came together, right? When everything was going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak. That's when this church came together. In fact, next Sunday, we are expecting to take part in a very historical moment for the life of this church and the life of Warren Baptist Association um, it throughout, I mean, just the, just the entire history of the association. We will most likely be welcomed into whole fellowship, complete fellowship into Warren Baptist Association. We will be the first multicultural church ever welcomed into Warren Baptist Association. And when I say multicultural church, I'm not saying, you got to understand that multicultural church is defined by at least there is um, less than 70% or less than 80% of one demographic, okay, or one, one culture, one race. If more than 80% of your culture, or one, more than 80% of your church is attended by one race, then it's not considered multicultural under most measurements, all right? So we are multicultural, in an association that has never been multicultural, in a time where we are dividing more than we're uniting. And so the question is, what is God doing? And that's often the question that I ask, but I don't have to linger on that question because I already know what he's doing. John 17 tells me what he's doing. He's making us one. And it's not an optional work for God. 
It's not, it's not a work that we can put down and, and, and because we deem it too challenging, too tough, too hard, and say, well, let's, let's, just, let's just throw this away. It's a work that we must dedicate ourselves to no matter how challenging, no matter how uncomfortable, no matter how difficult it is, because Jesus is praying for it. And so we are wrapping up this mini-series that we've been preaching through when, when Jesus prays by talking about the prayer that he prays for us, in particular, the first three verses of this passage, his prayer that we be one. His prayer that we be one. It's a prayer that we be unified, and it's a big prayer, like I said, because unity is elusive. No matter whether it is Jew and Gentile in the first century church, or it's American minorities and majority in the 21st century church, it is always difficult to bring two into one. So it warrants us paying attention to what Jesus says in this prayer. And he begins by saying, setting the foundation for unity, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one. He sets the foundation for unity by saying that they may all be one. The first thing that is necessary for us to understand or that's necessary for us to understand about the unity we have in Christ is that it is a unity that is forged in Christ. Jesus prays that the, pr the prayer that those who have come to believe in him might be one. All that believe in me, that they may all be one. Christ prays that the oneness will come as a result of us being in him. So believing in him, being in him, lays the foundation for unity. Our unity is rooted in his words that are shared. We are not... We are not unified just under any umbrella that we choose to create. Yes. We can unify under different creeds. We can unify under different platforms. We can unify under different organizations. But that is not the unity that Jesus is praying for, nor is it the unity that will keep us and sustain us. It's not the unity that will last. The unity where we must all begin is the unity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Christ being the Son of God and bringing salvation to the lost. The testimony that calls us to love God above all things and to love neighbor as ourselves. The testimony that sends us in the world, into the world to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the testimony that unites us. Those are the words that unite us. Those are the words that secure genuine unity for us. But our unity is not in just only in words. Our unity is also in relationship because he says that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So our oneness is founded in our union with Christ. The more committed we are to being found connected to him, listen, the less likely we are to find ourselves divided. From each other. You understand that? The more committed we are to being found in him, the less likely we are to be found divided from one another. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Galatians 2 where he says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have died alongside Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is now Christ who lives in me. I die. Christ now lives in me. Everything that I valued, everything that I held in high esteem, in high regard, everything that I held as supreme, those things have died. And now what matters, what's supreme, what's in high regard is Jesus yes. and him alone. He continued by saying, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I don't think that it was by accident that in this very passage, Galatians chapter 2, right before Paul says that, he tells us a story about confronting another apostle, the apostle Peter. Peter was in Galatia and hanging out with Gentile believers. And when the Jew Judaizers, the, the Jewish believers who believed that you had to hold to all of the law, came to Galatia, Peter would separate from the Gentiles. 
because the Gentiles were eating barbecue ribs and the Gentiles were uncircumcised. And Peter said, okay, well, my Jewish friends don't eat barbecue and all my Jewish friends are circumcised. What are they going to think about me if I'm hanging with these men? And so he separated from those men. And Paul said, I oppose Peter to his faith. Because he was out of step with the gospel. Because what was happening, Peter was now taking the identity that he had as a Jew and and letting that identity be elevated above his identity that he had in Jesus. So Paul, right after he describes this encounter, he tells us about dying to our identities that seek to elevate themselves uh, above the identity that we have in Jesus. So we have to Consider drilling down and then drilling past all those other identities that are in us. The political identities, the racial identities, the cultural identities, the historical identities. We have to get past those and we have to get to Jesus in order for us to hold fast to one another. It doesn't mean that those things can't have a place in our lives, and and it doesn't mean that those things cannot be the grounds in which, or or, or, or it does not mean that those things can't be, um, um, I guess, have moments in our lives. I mean, you can be a Republican, you can be a Democrat, but you simply cannot allow those things to be where unity rises and falls upon. Those things can't be where your identity ultimately lies. The reason why American Christianity is so divided is because we have unwittingly and unknowingly made all of these other identities a requirement for our Christian identity. There's no way that you can be a Christian and vote Democrat because there are some Democrats who push policies encouraging the aborting of babies that God declares he knew in the womb and ordained them with purposes. Oh, wait a second. There is no way that you can be a Christian and vote Republican because there are some Republicans who push policies encouraging a disregard for the needy and and the foreigners that are seeking aid that God calls us to assist and care for. Oh, wait a second. There is no way that you can be a Christian and a third party voter because you're you're casting an empty ballot and that ballot doesn't even count and and we only got two parties anyway so your ballot means nothing oh wait a second there is no way that you can be a christian and not vote because that just shows you don't care about america and on and on and on and and and, and what does the bible say about all of that you know where the bible lands on all of this nowhere In a system where godless policies exist on both sides, the Lord is calling us to be bold enough to speak truth to power, whether the power rides into your town on a red elephant or a blue donkey. He's calling you to speak truth to that power. He's calling you to push back evil, whatever side it's on, whether it's on the side of the elephant pushing or the side of the donkey pushing, he's calling you to push back evil. He's calling you to hold politicians accountable whenever they step outside of the bounds of Scripture and they declare that which is unrighteous is righteous. And they seek Selfish gain rather than the common good and flourishing of all people. And to do your best to vote your conscience without binding it to your identity. Because it is not your identity, Christ is. If we don't do that, folks, we'll never be united. If you spend more time identifying yourself as a Republican than a Christian or a Democrat than a Christian, we'll never be united. Or as a black man, or as a white man, or as a white woman, or a black woman, or Hispanic, or or Latino, or, or Asian, whatever you choose. He goes further in this verse. In verse 21, he says that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus is not praying for unity because it is in vogue. 
He's not praying for unity because it's stylish. You know, some churches, that's where, that's where it's going, you know, where you see, well, well, our culture is changing, and we're becoming more diverse, right? And so now, we need to have more white people in our church, and we need to have more black people in our church. Because if we don't, then we'll die. Well, well that ain't the reason why Jesus, is, Jesus wants your church to be diverse. The reason Jesus wants your church to be diverse is because 2,000 years ago, he was praying for it. He, he didn't care what your, what your neighborhood was doing, whether it was going to grow one way or the other. He was praying that you just be united in the neighborhood. He said, Father, may they be one. And in being one that they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. There's your reason. Jesus is spending his final moments before his crucifixion praying for us to be one because it advances the mission of the triune God in the universe by bringing those who don't know God into a saving relationship with God through Jesus Christ. How? Notice by them witnessing our oneness. See, we often associate truth with defending the faith. We say the truth is our apologetic. So we spend all of our time fighting for the truth and contending for the truth, which we ought to do, but let us not be mistaken. Truth is one part of your apologetic. Jesus is showing you that unity is also a part of your apologetic. So truth amongst a divided church does not have as much power as you think it does. It does not speak to the outside world the way you think it does. You can wave your truth banner all day, but if y'all can't figure out who's gonna have fried chicken or fried fish at the cookout without fighting, it's not bringing anybody together, or it's not bringing anybody to Jesus. Are you tracking with that? Jesus says in John 13, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So there it is. The apologetic is found in our love, in our unity, and in our truth. By these three things, we are defending the faith not just by one of those things. Paul tells us in Ephesians that we should speak the truth, but we should speak it always in love because it's by that that we are defending the faith. See, our commitment to deep unity that moves us beyond our social norms and our cultural norms will either bolster our evangelism to the world if it's done rightly or it will hinder our evangelism to the world if it's done wrongly. Earlier this year, we saw a Georgia church that, was, that had its denominational membership revoked because of blatant racism on display in its church as it dealt with a multicultural or multi-ethnic church plant that was using their space. That did harm to the witness of Christ. Earlier this year, we saw also, a, 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 and that was an all predominantly white church, we saw in a predominantly black church the pastor used one of his signs, his church signs, in front of the church building to put these words on prominent display. Quote, black folks need to stay out of white folks' churches. <laughs> Wait a second, he got something on the back of that sign too. I just gave you the front of the sign. On the back of the sign he said, white folks refuse to be our neighbors. Folks, that didn't help the cause of Christ. No matter how hurt you may be, that doesn't help the cause of Christ. On the flip side, we can bolster our evangelism through unity. I remember when the young, well, young, young ladies, talking about our females in the church, I'm just going to say young ladies. That's all, that's all of them. They're young, young, young in spirit, young at heart. 
Young in spirit, young at heart, right? The young, when the young ladies went to Jackson, they did this uh, kind of, they spent some time painting. They did this neat little outing together where they went and painted. And, and while they were there, uh, they, they were telling me about this story where the teacher and the other attendees were drawn to them because it was a group of sisters with deep, deep friendship that didn't look the same. White, black, just all gathered in the same space, enjoying one another. Matter of fact, the instructor inquired of them and said, hey, are you guys together? And, and they responded, yes, we all go to the same church together. And she was even more intrigued, asking them all sorts of questions. And the conversation culminated with this statement from her. She said, I was surprised that you were all together and that you were all a part of the same church because you genuinely seem to enjoy one another. Folks, that is an opportunity for evangelism to be bolstered when unity is on prominent display, supporting the truth of the gospel. Look at verse 23. Here's another interesting observation. It says, I in them and you in me that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Now pay attention to the words here, so that the world may believe that Christ was sent by the Father. That was one, that was one passage that we read. Now we hear in verse 23, so that the world may know that the Father sent Christ. And how do we move from believing to knowing? It's important to realize that this is somewhere that we won't get to until Christ returns, that we be perfectly one. But notice when we are perfectly one, in other words, when our unity has reached full maturation, we will move from belief to complete knowledge. In other words, as we grow closer together, our witness grows. You understand? With our unity goes our witness. The further we divide, the deeper we harm our witness. The more we unite, the stronger we make our witness. It's interesting about, what's interesting about Christianity in America is how committed we are to missions, advancing the kingdom of God to the nations, while sim simultaneously being completely and totally unconcerned about unity. How fascinating is it that we want to see the kingdom advance to all the world? And Jesus says that one of the ways that that happens is through unity. And we say, well, we don't really care about that. I mean, we want to take the gospel to the nations, but we don't want to come together in church because they do things differently over there. As a matter of fact, the statistics show that while four-fifths or 80% of the churches in this country remain segregated for whatever reason. Some reasons are legitimate and others aren't. But while 80% of this country remains segregated in its churches, less than half of the members that exist in those churches think that we have done enough or think that we should do more to desegregate. They think we've done enough. Don't feel the need to do anything else. So what becomes obvious to me and seems to be at the heart of Jesus' prayer is, that, is the reality that if we care about the advancement of the gospel to our blocks and in our cities and our country and our world, we should also simultaneously care about unifying. Because unity builds credibility in those missions to our block, our city, our nation, and our world. Do you understand that? So what does it look like? Well... Again, he says in verse 21, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be also in us. So the same way that I'm in you, the same way that you are in me, may they also be in us. Now, we won't ever fully, fully reflect that kind of unity, the unity that Christ and the Father enjoy, at least not on this side of heaven. But Jesus is praying that our unity reflect that, and that means that we should be aspiring towards it. Yeah. But what does that look like? What does that look like? What does that mean? It, means? it means several things. One, that we should be unified in message. When you hear Jesus talk about his relationship to the Father, he says, for I have not spoken on my own authority. That's what he says in John 12. But the Father who sent me 
has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So Jesus is unified in message with the Father. The words that he speaks, he speaks in message, in unity with the Father. And so we, too, can be unified in our words by carrying the message of the Father and the Son, the message of the gospel to the world, a message that first begins in God's holiness and man's dignity as image bearers, but then a message that continues with man's fallen nature when he sins in the garden and eats of the fruit that God forbid of him, but then a message that continues where Jesus rescues man by becoming the sacrifice, and he stands in the gap for man and his sinfulness and his waywardness, and he becomes man's salvation and redemption by faith. A message that continues in our embrace of Jesus as Lord and Savior that we call repentance. In other words, turning away from the old ways and embracing the new ways. See, as we stay on message together, unified, that reflects the unity of God the Father and God the Son. Does that make sense? Don't hear me as saying that that's the only thing you could ever talk about is the gospel. Because sometimes what we, what we do is we try, to, we, try to, we try to make the gospel not only the main thing, but the only thing. And so what we end up doing is that we say, well, wait a second, you can't really talk about sports and you can't really talk about politics. You can't talk about any of that. You can't have opinions on any of that. Just believe the gospel. Let's just talk about the gospel. No, 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 no. I mean, because the gospel infiltrates all of those areas. You understand? And so working all of that out together is a part of our ongoing sanctification. You you understand that? The gospel shapes those areas. And so it's necessary and important for us to come together oftentimes as a church to talk about those things so that the gospel can do the work on those things. But not only is he unified in message with the Father, he's unified in purpose with the Father. He says, says, truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says this in John 5, I can do nothing on my own accord, but only that what he sees the Father doing. For for whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. The Father and Son are united in purpose and mission, the salvation of the lost on the earth, the exaltation of the Son through the reconciliation of all things and the glory of God in the universe. They're united in purpose, and so should we. Be united in purpose. That's what our unity should look like. Unity in message, unity in purpose. Now, it sounds reasonable enough when we say it out loud. But the problem is, is that we're all dealing with hearts that are sinful and deceitful. And our knowledge is overwhelmingly clouded. So it is far easier for, 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 far easier rather than most of us care to acknowledge to co-sign and attach our purposes onto God's. Right? I mean, we can talk about oftentimes, hey, we're going we're gonna to have a uh, bless the block party at City Light Church next Sunday, and everybody will say, all right, so where are we going to meet? We'll say, we're going to meet at City Light Church, and everybody's going to be like, okay, that's great, that's fantastic, let's meet at City Light Church, and then bless the block party happens, and like half of the church does not show up, and it's not because they were at home sleep, they actually tried to come to it, and they couldn't get there, and it was like, man, we can't, we went to City Light Church, and the, the party wasn't happening, what, what happened to you guys? We, and, and the other half that showed up said, well, what do you mean, we had the, we had the party. Well, somebody went to City Light Church, in Biloxi, Mississippi, one half of the church. The other half of the church went to City Light Church in Vicksburg, Mississippi, right? Because we all can say City Light Church and yet and still have a different understanding of where City Light Church is and what City Light Church is about. And the same thing happens oftentimes when we talk about purpose in God, is that we all can say, let's be unified in purpose, except what you define as God's purpose and what I define as God's purpose are two completely different things. You define God's purpose as upholding a Democrat or a Republican platform. I define God's purpose as upholding other platforms. So we got different ideas for what his purpose looks like. And what do we do with that? Well, in order to, in order to fight that, we have to be very, very honest with each other about the fact that our hearts can create ulterior motives in, in how we attach or when we attach our agendas to God's purposes. We have to be very honest with each other about that. 
and say, yeah, man, my heart, my heart can do that. My heart can do that. I can want something so badly that I can now make it God's purpose for everybody rather than just God's calling for me. Are you tracking with that? And we need to be extremely honest with one another. Because when we refuse to be honest and humble about that, then we muddy up God's purpose. And when we muddy up God's purpose, division is going to happen. Once we muddy up God's purpose, then what's the next thing? If you ain't Democrat, you ain't with Jesus. If you ain't Republican, you ain't with Jesus. That's where it goes, right? Why? Because we attach our agendas and our motives to God's purpose. But let's be honest about the fact that we can muddy the waters up sometimes. Lastly, I'm sorry, let me say this and then I'll get to lastly. (laughs) Gave you a preacher juke. Lastly. Everybody's like, all right, we're ready to go. No, 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 not lastly. Gave you a preacher juke. All right, let me say this. Unity is not the same as uniformity. I need to say that. It's not sameness. It's not sameness. The triune God that we're reading about, let them be unified as, as we are unified, and yet they're not uniform. Jesus has a distinct role, distinct purpose. The Father has a distinct role and function. The Spirit has a distinct role and function, and yet they remain harmoniously unified. Ephesians 1 shows us those distinctions where it says that the Father chose us before the foundation of the world, but then it moves into verse 7 and it says the Son is redeeming us. So the Father chose, but the Son is redeemed. And then it moves into in the latter part of chapter 1 and it says that the Spirit is sealing. So the Father chose, the Son redeemed, the Spirit sealed. So they all had different functions, and yet they remained harmoniously unified. So when the Holy Spirit was first poured out on the day of Pentecost, and established the New Testament church, he could have just united us in language, could have united us in culture, made us one culture, made us one group, could have gave us one hymnal book, right? (laughs) Same day, same day, tongues of fire, fiery hymnal book, come down at the same time, could have handed it to us, said, all right, guys, y'all got your music, you got your same language, go forth as one church. He doesn't do that, though. He does not do that. Instead, he allows those languages to continue. He gives us the gift to understand one another in those languages. He gives us the ability to understand by the Spirit. He leaves us as separate nations and calls us to come together as one. He gives us different songs to sing under the same banner of Jesus Christ. He gives some of us drums to beat pianos to play, harps to stream or to strum, differences under the same banner. Does that make sense? Remember, Jesus is praying for the disciples that don't even exist, the disciples to come, um, from, and to come from all different places, Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, and to the ends of the earth. These are folks that have nothing in common, and he's praying that they be made one. These are folks with hatred in their hearts for one another, and he's praying that they be made one. But he never prays that they be made uniform. Matter of fact, we see that in the latter part of John or John's revelation where John looks out and he sees what? Every nation, every tribe, every tongue visible, present around the throne of God. God's blessing is not uniformity to us. It is the ability by his spirit to build an unusual unity in the midst of a globe-spanning diversity. That's his blessing to us. His blessing to us is in this room the ability for us to sing four or four uniquely different songs every single Sunday morning and still worship the same same God under those songs. That's his blessing to us. Lastly, (laughs) how is unity forged? How is it forged? 
He says in verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. So glory is how it's forged. I've given them glory so that they may be one even as we are one. And glory is an interesting concept because the word means weightiness, heaviness. It's the weightiness of God. It is the manifestation of God's divine heaviness. But it oftentimes can be difficult to grasp what he means by glory. Well, when he talks about glory, when we, when we, for example, when we look at the glory of Moses or the glory that was shown to Moses, Moses says, show me your glory in Exodus. Moses, one of the great prophets of Old Testament, says, show me your glory. And when God shows him his glory, before he shows him, he says, I will let my goodness pass before you. So we see manifested in God's goodness, so powerful and so strong that Moses was not even allowed to take it all in. Otherwise, he would be destroyed. So we can argue that glory along those lines, as it's being described, is goodness of God. But then it goes further when we look at John 17 because Jesus is praying that he be glorified with the glory that the Father gave him from the beginning or the glory he had with the Father from the beginning. And we we talked about a few weeks ago that when Jesus was praying to be glorified, he was talking about the cross, right? Because it's in the cross in which men are one to Jesus Christ, that eternal life is given to those that would trust him with their lives, and that God the Father is brought a people, that Jesus brings him a people through the cross. He wins a people for the triune God. So we talked about that being glory. Matter of fact, when you look at Jesus in his resurrection, after he resurrects from the grave, he goes and he talks to the disciples. He says, I'm about to leave, but I will not leave you empty handed for the arrival of the Holy Spirit will bring about power. So Christ could be saying that this divine glory that you have or or that or that or that I've given them in order to make them one. It could be the power that's manifested by the spirit as well. So I think it's all of it. I think Christ has given us through his through his life. He's shown us the character of God and given us the very goodness of God. Through his death, he has won us and redeemed us, right? And then through his resurrection, as he departs, he sends his spirit. And I think collectively, that is the divine glory that we've been given in order to be one. We have the gospel message. We have, we have, the, we have the character of God that we can look on and understand what it means to be one, right? Right? What does it mean to be one? When we look to the life of Jesus, we understand what it means to be one and how to become one. The gospel message is what we unite under in order to sustain and be and and remain one. But then the power of the Spirit keeps us coming together, right? Allows us to shower one another with with love in the face of hurt and in the face of uh, transgressions against each other. To respond to those things with mercy instead of rage. So I think all of that collectively is what God uses to keep us and to make us one. We have everything we need, in other words. So, a few applications. Study well. Study well. Read your Bible. I'm giving you an application as to how to be one. Read your Bible, because that is a means of glory. It's showing you the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's showing you the character of God. As we continue to read the Word of God, we continue to grab a hold of God's message and God's purpose. We continue to see what unity looks like, right? The Word trains our minds to think like He thinks. The more we think, Or the more we read, the clearer our hearts are in processing his will for us. So read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible, not New York Times. Your Bible. Read New York Times, but read your Bible. Not Fox News and CNN and MSNBC, but your Bible. You can watch those, but read your Bible too. 
Because if you just watch all of that and you don't read your Bible, then your mind and the way you think will take on the nature of those things you're consuming in opposition to your Bible. And it will create more division rather than unity. So read your Bible. Bear well with one another. Study well, but bear well. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Learn to understand the person who weeps before you oppose them. When there's a gun, another gun issue in our country, before you lean, jump on your side for or against gun control, why don't you just spend a few days just weeping with those that are weeping? Are you tracking with that? Typically, people get mowed down, and within minutes, we're arguing over whether or not guns are literally within minutes. We're talking about should we have the guns or should we not have the guns? Should we have background checks? Should we not have? Why don't we just spend a little time just trying to bear well with the people that are weeping? Because we, if, if we don't learn how to bear well, if our partisanship becomes more important than the people that that partisanship is supposed to be aiding and helping, then we will always stay divided. Listen well. Study well, bear well, listen well. One of the obstructions to unity is the fact that we don't listen to each other. We talk before we listen. We're in a society where people are too eager to talk and nobody wants to listen to each other. Our society awards tweets, viral tweets, hot takes on Facebook versus silence. But the Bible tells us that we are to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Got people yelling yelling across the stage or yelling across the Facebook and Twitter stage that racism is dead, right? Just a couple of months ago, my wife is at a Home Depot and somebody yells out the N-word at her. Listen, right? Listen well. Don't assume you got all the answers because it doesn't exist in your space. Listen well. Forgive well. Unity will not happen if we don't learn how to forgive each other. We tell people at this church, listen, there will come a point in time where I'm going to sucker punch you in the throat. I didn't mean to. Didn't mean to. But it's going to happen, right? I'm going to say something to you. You're going to be like, what? Who does he think he is, right? And I'm not going to even know I said it, right? It's just going to be like, I was just, I didn't realize that hurt you. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even know. Or maybe, maybe I did know. Maybe I was having a bad day, and I'm like, I want you to have a bad day too, so I'm going to say something ugly. I, I don't know. But, but the, point, the point we're making, I'm not going to go around trying to do that to y'all, y'all. The point that we're making is that you should be prepared, prepared because we're all operating in this human fallen nature. You should be prepared for the moment where things don't go right. When we say the wrong thing and we don't understand each other like we thought we should have understood each other and that we're in the middle of a conversation and somebody blurts out, you people, what do you mean, you people? That's all right. It's all right. It's all right to cross sometimes because that's the only way we get to the real heart of the matters. That's the only way we unify, but we got to be willing to forgive each other when we go there. Does that make sense? And then lastly, pray well. Jesus prayed well. He prayed for our unity. And if Jesus prayed for our unity, how much more so should we spend time praying for it? What if God just sovereignly decided to do this, right? What if he ordained that in the most divided time in the last several decades, that he would build a church in order to allow unity to contrast that much more from division, right? What if he just sovereignly allowed it in order to show cities and worlds, countries, what the Christian, what the Christian life truly looks like? Not just city life, church, but churches all over the world. What if he allowed division to exist in such a way amongst his church so that his church would stand out that 
much more so that the light would shine that much brighter because the darkness is so dark. Maybe that's exactly what he's doing, right? We know he's doing something because he prays for it. And the one thing that we know about Jesus, looking at John 17, is that everything he prayed for, he received. So he prayed for our oneness. So saints of God, we can take confidence in knowing that we will be one, completely, perfectly made one through the one that died for us and prays for us. Amen.